few years ago I was browsing through eBay and I saw this and at first glance I thought it was a VT100 but then as I looked at the image I realised it wasn't a VT100 it's actually a televideo I believe it's a model 950 but I think it's modelled on the VT100 as uh, you can see it has a fairly similar appearance and the general design the dimensions are different but the general uh, appearance and layout is fairly similar from the outside uh, these are quite interesting they're kind of at the smart end of the dumb terminal spectrum uh, quite interesting devices I've only ever worked on one of these before and it was a very long time ago so I can't even remember how the internals are laid out um, I don't have any technical documentation for this if anyone has anything for this schematics or a user manual then please contact me and um, if we turn it around you can see it has the usual terminal connections the only uh, odd one here that we don't often see is the uh, RS422 the rest are all fairly standard I do have the keyboard for this it's in about the same condition as this part of it we'll look at that in another video uh, and then we have the uh, printer connection and the RS232 then we have two switch banks for configuration um, voltage selection switch power switch fuse mains cable and uh, the contrast control so all very simple very straightforward I'm not going to just switch this on because judging by the outside condition I've got a feeling that if I turn this on it would either do nothing at all or there would be a loud bang um, I had intended to restore this but it turned up with a fairly um, damaged case the usual uh, seller excuse was well it's old um, so he didn't bother packing it right which I always think is a ridiculous uh, statement you know grandma's old but you don't drag her behind the car when you go to the shops so um, I probably won't bother restoring this it's um, never going to look uh, pristine I will of course clean it up but the first thing I want to do is get the cover off and we'll have a look inside see if it's intact I don't even know if the tube is broken I suspect not normally if the tube uh, neck is broken off you'll get the phosphor um, degrading and I have had this for a few years so it's had plenty of time to do that if the tube was broken doesn't mean the rest of it isn't broken like I said it was um, a very badly boxed when it turned up it was just basically in a box uh, with no padding and uh, you can see it's all scuffed up where it was uh, probably upside down in the van um, so anyway we'll get the cover off have a look inside hopefully the main board is in there there's quite a lot in these in terms of electronics but we'll have a look inside if the main board and power supply are there we may have a chance at getting this to come back to life so I'll get the top cover off just uh, four screws that hold the cover on and then I'll pop the cover off and we'll have a look inside before I take the cover off I thought you might be interested in seeing this this is the original colour you can see how it's yellowed uh, usual um, problem with this type of plastic um, if I can get this working and it's in good enough condition I may retrobrite this and bring it back to the proper colour um, but we'll see how we get on um, it's always difficult to tell at the beginning of a project how far I'm going to go with it it really depends what we find in the next few minutes when we take the cover off so I'll get the cover off we'll have a look inside so that's the cover off the tube actually looks to be in fairly good condition which is a bit of a surprise um, it's obviously been stored somewhere damp there's a lot of rust on the chassis but we'll spin it round and uh, it is indeed this is the mains cable it is indeed uh, rather grubby in here no idea what that is uh, the tube seems to be intact which is good news so we've got the main board here there's a big transformer underneath this is the control board for the CRT and the power supply here on the right so what I'm going to do before I make any attempt to power this up I'll try and power it up like this if it does work then chances are we will destroy it by putting power through this this is probably one of the dirtiest boards I've ever seen this does seem to be fairly common the one I repaired before was um, it was about 20 years ago and it wasn't that old but inside it was filthy I think it's just the nature of the way the case is designed There's a lot of big vents on the top and I think uh, it just falls into the machine um, but this is uh, particularly dirty so um, I'm not quite sure what's going on there but 
Um, all I'm going to do is uh, take the chassis out of the case and um, I can then work on the case separately and uh, we'll get the main board out, get the CRT out of the way. We'll have a look at each of the boards in turn and then uh, ultimately we'll get it all uh, reconnected and see what it does. But first thing, I need to get this board clean, but I will show it to you once I've got it out before I clean it. So that's step one. All we have to do is unplug everything from the main chassis. We can then lift the chassis out after removing the six screws that bolt it into the plastic case. We can then just lift this out and put the plastic case to one side for now. And uh, I can now work on removing the board. So this board just really slides out. It's on some uh, PCB guides. All we have to do is unplug the remaining connectors and we should then be able to slide it out towards the rear of the machine. So this board was a bit too tight to slide out. As I say, it's on uh, two PCB guides and there's a metal plate under here that holds the bottom part of the chassis together. And it was pushing so hard on the board I couldn't slide the board out. So all I've done is slacken off the three screws on this side. And the board should in theory now slide out. Let's put this out of the way. So as I said, there's more in here than you might expect for a terminal. So the chassis is fairly standard. It's just got a normal CRT controller board, a fairly standard CRT, and then a power supply. So we'll look at the power supply separately, but I'll get this out of the way for now, and we'll have a quick look at the board. So as you can see, the board is really dirty, and um, the first thing I'm going to do is clean this so we can, if nothing else, identify what parts are on here. Have a quick look on the underside. It doesn't look too bad. It does appear that somebody may have replaced a few of the parts. Either that or they've been getting very hot. Seems like it was done quite some time ago. Other than that, it doesn't seem to be in terrible condition, so... Okay, well, I'll go and get this cleaned, um, try and get it a bit more presentable, and uh, we'll go from there. Cleaning these can take a bit of time, so um, I'll do this the shortcut way. Okay, well, that's the board cleaned. Now, as you can see, it's cleaned up quite nicely for a change. It wasn't somebody's old nicotine collection, so it cleaned very easily. And um, I've got different ways of cleaning different boards, and I'm quite often asked how I clean these. And uh, it kind of depends on uh, what's on the board that I've got to clean off. In this case, it was just really dust and dirt. So this was under the tap, a bit of detergent, into the ultrasonic bath for about half an hour, uh, dried it off and rinsed it with uh, fresh water, dried it off with the compressor, set on a very low pressure, about 20 psi, using an air duster, blew off all the uh, water, make sure there's no water trapped under the sockets. The main thing is to get these properly dry. The, the water itself is not a problem as long as you get rid of it fairly quickly after you've finished. Also you need to make sure that you do thoroughly clean the board. If you only partially clean it you can make things worse. If you um, put water on certain types of contaminants, if it's got a bit of salt or something on it, you can actually make the uh, board condition far worse than just leaving it dirty so if you're going to get it wet you need to make absolutely certain that you do clean it very thoroughly that's why I put it in an ultrasonic bath once I've got the worst off. It then goes into an oven at about 55 centigrade for in this case it was four hours it depends on the type of board again you've got to be careful some boards the um, control board for the CRT for example we can't immerse that in water because of the transformers so we don't want to get certain components wet. There's nothing on here that would um, cause any issues getting it wet. The worst thing on here in terms of water will be the switches. If you get water inside them, they can take a long time to dry out. And you want to get rid of the water before any corrosion sets in. But uh, this one's cleaned up nicely. Next thing I'm going to do, I'm not going to power this up now, of course. We're going to move on and uh, have a look at the power supply. So I'll get the power supply out of the chassis. We'll have a look at that. 
the same process get it cleaned but we'll look at it first and you can see what condition it's in to start with so I've removed the power supply and it has seen better days it's looking like it's been running hot this um, Paxilin type PCB does tend to discolour fairly readily even at relatively modest temperatures but um, the main concern here are the uh, pins uh, have been getting hot as well so probably a loose connection on here and um, one thing I do need to do is replace some of these capacitors this one in particular is showing corrosion on the outside it's uh, pretty hard to see on the camera but it's got a very um, bumpy looking texture and it's nice and crispy so that um, almost certainly would have failed if we tried powering this up the other two don't look too bad but um, we'll be fairly careful about powering this up I'll connect it to a bench supply run it up before we try connecting this back to the machine uh, quite often what can happen especially with this type of power supply is if we get a short on here and uh, the output transistors go short they can feed quite high voltage directly into the main board and destroy most of the components on it uh, just going to check the fuses to make sure they're not blown quite often it's a good indication if the fuses are blown somebody's powered it up and it's uh, damaged something so I'll just get the meter okay we'll test the fuses that one's fine and that one's fine so that's a good sign it means that uh, it's less likely somebody's come along and powered this up and done any real damage it's not always uh, indicative of a machine that's going to work of course but the next thing I need to do is remove the board from the heatsink replace any of the capacitors that look uh, a bit on the dodgy side I don't reform capacitors um, separately uh, unless it's an, an old valve type machine where they're foil and paper capacitors the, this type of um, capacitor normally if you bring the voltage up steadily um, during testing they'll be fine and if there is a fault with one that will show up during that testing as well so uh, I'll get this cleaned get this removed replace the caps that need it and then we'll run this up and see if we're getting any sensible power supplies so as you can see this capacitor does appear to have leaked it's left quite a lot of mess on the board I'm going to remove these capacitors I don't normally take capacitors off a board unless I suspect they're faulty but I want to get a look underneath they are kind of half sealed to the board and they don't appear to be bad but I just want to get a look underneath and make sure they haven't leaked and then I'll clean this board up it doesn't look too bad on the underside um, but uh, I thought we'd test um, this capacitor see what it reads as so we've got our test meter and this is supposed to be 470 microfarads so we'll try testing that and see what we get So 4.9 microfarads so it's lost a bit of its capacitance we'll just compare that to a brand new 470 microfarads capacitor a little over 400 so um, you can see that this capacitor has plainly failed what I'm going to do is just slice the cover off and I want to look at the case to see if this is corrosion or if something else has got down there I suspect it's just corrosion of the uh, aluminium housing okay so I've sliced down the side we'll just try and peel the outer cover off getting by all the uh, white powder that's coming out there's quite significant corrosion in here and indeed as we expected the entire case has been corroded the screws holding this to the heatsink were very badly corroded as well they really put up a fight so I suspect this has been stored somewhere fairly damp it doesn't necessarily bode well for the main control board um, but as you can see from this capacitor it was really in need of changing so I will pop the others out clean the board up and then in the next video we'll try applying some power to this and see what happens I thought I would show this just in case any of you are interested this is the way I normally test capacitors like this I check the capacity to make sure they are reading roughly what they should be but then I apply something close to their maximum rated voltage DC voltage 
and I leave them for several hours, sometimes overnight. And what I'm looking for is to make sure that the uh, leakage current doesn't start to rise and they don't start to get warm. So, so we can use the bench supplies to do this. And uh, I've got both supplies on. I have um, one connected to the bottom supply and one to the top. The one on the right is um, 3300 microfarads at 35 volts. The one on the left is 4700 microfarads at 16 volts. So I've got these supplies set to something close to the limit. Now, I am not doing this to reform the capacitors. I've never found a need to reform modern capacitors. I only ever do that for the old um, foil type. I, as I said, I've never found a need to do it with these types. What I'm looking for here is a failure of the capacitor. Now this doesn't really fully test them. It's usually ripple current and that sort of thing that causes capacitors like this to fail. And um, they, generally speaking, if they are starting to get a high internal resistance, then the ripple current causes them to heat up. Now that in turn accelerates the kind of drying out process and that's ultimately what seems to lead to their imminent demise. So just before I finish this video, I thought I'd show how I go about testing them. Got them hooked up. We'll turn the first, I haven't powered this up yet. These have just been removed from the board, so I haven't done anything to them yet. So what we're looking at is see if they act like uh, capacitors. So I've got these hooked up. I have not powered the supplies up yet. So these have just been removed from the board, hooked up, and we'll power them up one at a time. I've got the current limit set on both supplies to 100 milliamps. So we should see initially a spike in current as they charge up and uh, that current should fairly rapidly go down and um, the capacitor should then just sit there holding that charge without drawing current. So we'll start with the first one, we'll power this on and see what happens. So keep an eye on the current here, it's channel 1, the yellow channel. And you can see the current is very low. So this, uh, as I said, doesn't, they tend not to reform. They either work or they don't work. And if they do work, then really what we're looking for here is to make sure they don't develop any leakage and um, they act like capacitors. We'll do the same thing now with the top one. So here we're looking at channel two, that's a blue channel. And we're looking for any appreciable uh, leakage current after the uh, first few seconds. So we'll turn this on. And once again, we are seeing no real leakage current. So this is all I'm going to do. I'll monitor these every now and again with a thermal camera. Having the current limit set low means that if they do develop a fault, in theory at least, they shouldn't draw enough power to quickly overheat. They will if they're left a long time, but um, they almost certainly aren't going to explode within a few seconds if they do develop a fault. This one, I'm not going to bother testing. There's not really any point. I will just replace that. I doubt these will need replacing. There was no real sign of leakage when I took them off the board, but uh, we'll leave them here for a few hours and make sure they behave themselves.